this question and also the explanation was a really good, uh, um, a really good, yeah, a really good <laughs> thing. Um, uh, uh, I am uh, Überleitung. I'm missing the English <laughs> word here. Uh, so for the next topic, because actually uh, it is a big problem if you if you once you move in a natural language space, uh, you see. There's yeah, so much new tech and it's great and you see, oh, it's all working in English and I tried myself, it's really, it's not that easy to have this working in German because most of the research is actually in English, I would say the second most is Chinese. So, of course, it's really important to understand what your data is about and which space you're working and which features actually matter. And this brings me to our next talk. I'm really happy to have Alisa here. Alisa is a data engineer at Freenow, is it called now by taxi? At Freenow from Hamburg. Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Alisa. One second. So. Hi there, my name is Alisa, as Alex already mentioned. I'm machine learning engineer or data science engineer is a different or older name, which suggests that I do mostly software like backend engineering, but very specified and work with the models that my peers produce and try to put them production ready into our system, which means I have to check that the model itself is not several gigabytes of the size, that it's fast enough, that the feature engineering, if we're talking about uh, model prediction on demand, um, works fast enough, and all the optimization things from just the coding optimization up to what data and how it's going in. So let's uh, consider a pipeline. Uh, what is a normal pipeline in general of machine learning? It's data collection first, we're talking about all possible data types uh, and formats, then we prepare them so that we can use it with the models. Also it will depend, the preparation step will depend uh, a bit on what you model intend to use, libraries. For instance, some libraries just do not work with timestamps in their normal uh, form, like data type timestamp, but they need to be unwrapped into floats or whatever. Um, then we are creating features. These are things that go into model directly. From the raw data, you might use up to 10% or full 100% of the data. Then we do some sort of feature selection. So, whoops, I think I'm, I've lost my audience. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> cool. Hello. <laughs> so feature selection and feature engineering kind of comes together in a loop. Feature selection is uh, either when you, I don't know what's happening, maybe I'm stepping on something. <laughs> uh, maybe. Okay, I'm not touching it. Huh? Maybe we need to touch it a little bit more. Okay, I will touch it more. <laughs> <laughs> A-B testing. No, actually, uh, it, it looks like it goes uh, the same as like that. Oh, okay. It's strange. Okay. Um, so that. then, uh, feature selection is the features that uh, introduce the most important things to the model. Um, model training, model evaluation, and repeat over again. So this is the normal thing. Visually, it would look like this. So you collect everything you can of different form and shapes, you try to create the proper input for our cow, which is our model, and it produces the milk, which is our insights. So we will be uh, concentrating on these three things technically, feature engineering, feature selection, and how the model and feature selection can work in a loop with uh, each other. Um, I will uh, create a small example here for this um, meetup. I chose uh, Formula One tables. It is, the data is available on Kaggle. We will try to predict, given a small uh, amount of data, whether these um, specific uh, racer will be in the top five for a race. So baseline model, again, it's not a perfect example. I was not going for good numbers. It's just something that you can easily use. Random forest classifier because we have top five, it's like from zero and one, <coughs> if it is, and zero is not. Um, so we have several uh, tables. You can imagine data is uh, kept in SQL. So the driver, the races uh, table, which has only explanation of when it was, what uh, amount of rounds, circuit ID, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Um, name is being encoded because there is like Australian, Monaco, and stuff like that, and it's uh, categorical values, so for easiness, uh, of work for the model, we've encoded it. 
On the um, GitHub, you can see the raw data and the uh, raw model, so you can check it out and work with it as well. And standings is the combined um, table that shows when what was happening. Whoops. So, what if we want to predict if the pilot was in the top X, in our case in top five for the race, um, what can we put in into the model? So it's a driver ID, which will, for instance, replace the driver name and all the specifics, um, date of birth, nationality, race ID, like where he was taking uh, part in, name of the race, or name of, even of the um, uh, race as well. For instance, if it's Schumacher, people just assume that it's genetic. You are a good racer. Um, and the features would be, like this is the raw data, the features would be driver ID, date of birth, split into the year and months. Um, nationality, for instance, as a categorical value again. Um, race ID is an um, integer date uh, of the race split into year and months again, and name either of the race. Like, let's go, let's go with the race. Um, for a model to work, uh, I took um, scikit-learn classifier, so it needs one table to be put in. It cannot take different uh, sources differently. It should be one input. So we put it into simple model df, which contains every data we need from the tables you saw before. Uh, why am I doing this? Um, and the model was at 91%. It's a really small data set and uh, it's pretty simple and the model is like random forest in general quite good at generalization and catching the uh, features. So it's okay, it's good. But can we do better? Um, so the feature that you would think of would be how old was the driver when he took first uh, part in this race? Or how long did he take a pause between the races? Was he taking how many races before was he participating in? All those features that you can, can come up with as a domain expert are quite annoying to create. For instance, this is called feature engineering and it can be done automatically or manually. Manually is a domain knowledge um, where you can even unite outside sources of the data to bring them in and uh, to provide the model with more insights. And automatic approach, I will be demonstrating now. So yeah, manual features I've already called and I will be presenting feature tools library which is quite popular right now and has really neat default settings. If you want to tinker more and spend some time playing with it, you can get really amazing results. But in this presentation, we will go with default, so anybody can just start it and get something out. Um, the way Feature Tools works, it uh, works on SQL tables, so it's joining them, joining the columns, and does some transformation that are pretty fine in the core of the library. You need to create an entity set, which would be just the use case you're creating, then you provide the tables by entity say it from uh, this entity entity from data frame. You provide also the columns, you provide the types of the columns so that uh, certain operations are not applied to some columns that does not make sense to operate on. For instance, unique number of um, IDs, like yeah, thank you, it is unique already. Um, and then you need to specify the connections between the tables. They currently work one-on-one. -on -one. So if you have a table with multiple foreign keys, you might run into really weird features. They still might work, but it's not something a real human will come up with. So the suggested uh, line of behavior is to cascade-wise connect them. In this case, drivers and standings are connected via driver ID, and races uh, and standings are connected via race ID. Connections should be unique, like in any SQL table it's desired. Um, then we create the feature matrix and the feature definitions. Feature matrix is just a data frame with all the additional columns. I think I'm stepping on something. Okay. Um, you create a data frame out of all the data you have and just um, column-wise combination and uh, weird magic uh, done to it. Um, this is the default setting, you can do way more, you can specify what um, 
transformation to apply, data transformation, what depths you use. Normally you don't go beyond two. I was just toying around with four. Normally it goes like how many transformation to apply to M1 column, two columns and so on and so forth. So it can be up to 10 or even more, which again is not humanly understandable anymore. So for instance, like unique sum of log of square root of something else. So it might make sense, might not. So the accuracy actually of the very same model, but with all the columns now, um, is increased by 17%. No, 17, uh, 7 point, uh, 1 point, wait, 10%, about 10%. So it is better, but we get about 33 features in from original seven. And it's, um, you can see uh, some limited feature importance of the model. And you can see that uh, mode of standing races of the year is kind of weird. So these are all generated features and they are having quite a small weight to the model. So these are the features that were generated. And some of them are like, what the hell? I do not think that this will work. Um, what can you do? You can start doing feature selection and the more features you have, the better your feature selection will get. It also will become very cumbersome, but it will work better once you have to, more to work with. Why feature selection is important? It reduces overfitting, which is a big problem. You can so overfit your model that it's just not usable anymore and this is normally what uh, people try to avoid and you don't need. Um, it improves accuracy as they are too connected and it also reduces training time. The more features you have, the more data you have, the more iterations a model needs to actually learn the patterns. If you have uh, time, money and uh, hardware, cool, but it's not always the case, especially if you want to rapidly prototype. So how to? Um, we can do manual feature selections, again, based on the domain knowledge or certain um, estimators that models provide. For instance, weights that contribute to the model, we can just set a cutoff that's saying above 12, uh, 0 0.12 is something really that means something to the model, otherwise just drop it. Or we can try to automatically, um, try to use automatic systems for that. Um, the semi-manual approach would be to use something from scikit-learn as well, but set the threshold to a certain degree. For instance, we can um, ask scikit-learn to have model fit, and then it will automatically discard all the um, columns that it doesn't think it needs to. You can just use default value, but you can also set your own. Again, it's the same. <laughs> situation where you say that uh, the weight should be above a certain threshold. There is a good article on this. I'm not sure whether I should touch it at all. So there is a good article on this, you can follow the link, and it has more in-depth detail um, examples on uh, every three um, examples. So this would be select from model, which is automatic one. You provide the training set, you provide your model, um, which is the parameter on the second line. So this is our classifier. And scikit-learn decreases the amount of features that the model uh, consumes from 33 to 11. I must say the accuracy was not better though. But you can wait, uh, expect that, that in general your accuracy on a test set will increase with the amount of data you fit in and also amount of features because you are overfitting but on the training set and on validation set, you will be not succeeding. So right now we see a different picture for this 11 um, instances or 11 features. Okay, so automatic, but not good enough. What else can we do? We can do a heat map. Um, it's a pre-model training feature selection. We can create a heat map or correlation of all the features with uh, each other and set a certain threshold to exclude them if they are being correlated. For instance, everything about above 0.5 is kind of weird, or 0.7, so it's somewhat domain knowledge uh, and expertise knowledge as well. Um, 
but you want to do it automated. Okay. Uh, in this presentation, I want to show you a T-Port. T-Port is actually not only a feature selection automation, it's automation of the whole pipeline, of a, or rather of a big chunk of it. Um, it utilizes um, genetic algorithms to try to create some really weird feature combinations, as well as uh, tuning hyperparameters of the model, as well as choosing the best model for you, if you go with the full set of the features of this library. So this is what you can find on the T-Port documentation. So you can see, again, you have a raw data and raw data cleaning or data processing, pre-processing, and then feature selection, uh, feature engineering, feature construction, uh, and the model are kind of in a circle. And parameter optimization technically goes also into this uh, circle. So the big problem with this is it runs everything from data input to output and create the pipeline for you, like scikit pipeline, if you uh, have ever seen those, in an additional file, and you can just run this file and it will execute it again and create the model itself. Um, the problem is it's not guaranteed to have the very same result on the very same data because of different uh, genetic mutations it introduces. Um, it is uh, limited because it uses cross-validation as its estimator for models comparing those. And for me, for quite a small amount of data, we are talking about less than 1,000 rows, it ran for that much seconds, that many seconds. Uh, I increased the amount of data up to 3,000 rows and it was running for two hours. So you can imagine why it's happening because it's trying everything that a human would not even touch out because it has no sense of, yeah, this feature does not make sense, how even I would produce it. Um, but again, for someone who has no idea how to select it or just wants to try it out, I think it's a really cool place to start. So the auto machine learning classificator that was created, I was um, explicitly, I've explicitly chosen the random forest classifier that it once, actually only once suggested. Um, it only performed at this uh, accuracy level, which is again worse than our starting model. So you have to think twice if you want to incorporate it. Um, the limitations, so T-Port is a so-called AutoML, automatic machine learning pipeline. It has a couple of limitations. It requires time, as you saw. Um, it has very high complexity and it's less under control because it's the whole process. You can't say, stop there, tune this parameter instead of that one, and then continue. Um, it results uh, might differ. So you might not even introduce, for some reason you just uh, triggered the run again and you got a different model. So do you deploy the new model? Are you okay with your old one? So what do you do? Especially if the uh, cross-validation or any other estimator that you can use is the same. There are a lot of questions about the results it produces. Less control as an overall, and uh, new features require the whole pipeline run, meaning the new model can be suggested to the new features, which is, again, it's rather unstable thing to use on production. So this is basically it, what I wanted to show you today with TLDR, uh, automatic, automative or automate feature engineering, feature selection, and the whole machine learning process is still kind of sloppy. It is possible, but uh, if you have a people that can get into the core of these programs and, for instance, have a control by stopping uh, the run of these programs at certain uh, phase, like model creation and then redirecting to a certain model, or fixing the amount of features or fixing the amount of parameters it can tweak. Um, this specific uh, library is not there yet, but Google and IBM rolled out recently their own AutoML uh, libraries that are worth checking out. The reason you need automation in these um, things is manual processes are not scalable, and uh, they are not scalable in terms of human power and uh, time needed, because every feature that is being created might not play well with the other features. It might be collinear, and you might not even no uh, notice that before you run the test or before you put it onto production. Also, you might not know whether this feature is um, easy to come by if you are 
creating um, machine learning on request. Like you want to have a prediction for a racer, but you don't know his name for some reason. Or you don't know the year he was born in. So this model becomes unusable. And when you're training it manually, you have control over such things. So yeah, this is what I wanted to present to you today about automatic feature engineering and selection. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, I think it's pretty awesome. So uh, I have a question. So because there's always a little, yes, Christoph has a question, I've seen you. Uh, it's like, there's a lot of discussions going on about that data and data science is basically uh, automating humans and you're a data engineer, a data science. Do you feel threatened by AutoML or do you think it's a tool? It is a tool. For instance, there are use cases when you need to automate your uh, workflow to be able to concentrate on the cool things. Um, on the other hand, it's just so bad. So I'm not feel threatened at all. Yeah, so. <laughs> a human expertise is so far always better because of how humans can work. Only humans can create something new, some completely new concept and introduce really valuable features into the model if it's required. In comparison to these models, even if they use really advanced um, algorithms like, um, oh God, I forgot the name. <laughs> Uh, the uh, mutations that they introduced to the features, it's still very small changes. And it's not able to, by chance, combine two completely different sources it's never seen. So in this case, it is a cool thing to play around, to test ideas, to maybe even automate certain part of your work, like unwrapping timestamps, like creating low-level simple features that you don't want to skip or spend your time on. But if you want to achieve really good results, no. Don't be threatened at all. Uh, yeah, my question was mostly like, um, AutoML is pretty cheap as an algorithm, right? It's just plain evolution with epochs and very cheaply implemented in the sense of what it knows about the features themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the generation aspect of behind it is like pretty, pretty cheap. Um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, there was like a new paper released uh, called Weight Agnostic Neural Networks, which was basically using the approach of NEAT or NEAT-based algorithms and trying to combine them with the idea that they are weight agnostic so that the layers in between, from speaking of AutoML, it is able to have something like CNN layers or LSTM layers and stuff like that and combine them. And basically, it only learns XOR all the time, literally. Mm -hmm. So that's why it performs the worst. Um, also bad compared to other algorithms. And the idea behind NEAT, and the idea behind NEAT was that the evolutionary algorithm is aware of like the um, features themselves, like in the sense that it knows the, the relations between the time sensitivity and stuff like that. And my question is mostly uh, whether you try it out to compare, for example, like um, weight diagnostic neural networks or NEAT or other al algorithms with AutoML, and did they outperform them or not? Or I not didn't go that deep. Like, I don't think this automative approaches, like my idea was to show simple steps can be automated. Um, the problem with the more complex model you have, the more control you need over your automation steps as well, like feature preparations. With neural networks, you need more, first, more data. Uh, second, the data might be not that linear com uh, connected to each other, like columns should not be very obviously connected. Um, I mean, the reason you use neural networks is already you want to learn something cool. So I haven't uh, compared those. I think um, these are stupid ones, rather. They are rather random uh, combination of features. It might work, it might not work, but there is no guarantee. And the um, advanced models that you suggested will mostly always outperform algorithms that come out of this one. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, give a pause again to Alisa.